I'm Zach Carlson. So I'm based in Fargo and have been on uh, with NDSU for a little over two years now. So fairly new to the program. Tonight, I'm going to talk about implants and kind of how those fit into backgrounding uh, operations. Uh, there's a, some newer developments in terms of labeling of implants and where they can actually be applied given some new regulations by the FDA. So we'll, we'll kind of touch on the value of them and then get into some of those new updates. Okay, so implants, right, are, are a natural hormone or an analog, a synthetic of a natural hormone. And they've been around for a long time. Uh, FDA approved them in 1956 and we've been doing uh, continuous research on them ever since. So we still do plenty of implant research throughout the university system and commercial trial data uh, still. And so uh, they've been probably the most research technology uh, thus far in the beef cattle segment. Um, and so we uh, feel pretty confident about the results that we get from that given the, the repeatability uh, over time in, in that research. And so, of course, these uh, are placed subcutaneously in the ear, right, the back of the ear, uh, specifically in the middle third, both horizontally and vertically on the ear. And I'll show you a diagram of that in a little bit. And what they do is uh, send a cascade of, of activity to improve average the gain and feed efficiency. So you can kind of see those values there are rough estimates of improvement in the average daily gain. And uh, this, this statistic is a little dated, but probably still uh, relatively um, accurate in that more than 90% of feedlot cattle are implanted at least once in their lifetime. So it's still a heavily used uh, technology to improve our beef production. And, uh, and how it does that is through the increase in protein deposition. So it, uh, it shifts the growth curve. And what I mean by that is it essentially uh, puts gain back towards uh, protein and muscle development or, and, and oh, away from uh, fat deposition. So Particularly in our backgrounding diets, we're not at a finishing state yet. Our diets aren't don't have enough energy, right? That's not our intentions. Uh, uh, Tim mentioned earlier about making sure we're not getting our calves too fleshy in that right in that sense, right? As there's discounts there for backgrounding cattle, and so in that sense, um, uh, really, it's it's not as much of an issue in terms of worrying about the impacts on marbling and everything in our backgrounding diets. Um, as it, it's really focused on protein deposition at that point in the calf's uh, growth cycle. And, uh, uh, and so it really just kind of helps stimulate that, that muscle development and further developing those muscles. So then, uh, of course, that uh, results in that body composition difference. Okay, so I wanted to get right into some of the, the numbers, right, and improvements uh, that we see. And so, here at the top, we have days on feed. And then on the left-hand side here, you'll see a no implant using a Ralgro and a Cinevex set. So throughout my presentation here, I'll mention a lot of, of brand names and things like that. And that's really because um, there's three major implant manufacturers, Alenco Animal Health, Merck Animal Health, and then Zoetis. And so um, oftentimes it, it gets specific later on when I talk about the FDA label changes, uh, we'll talk specifically about which implants uh, those are actually addressing currently. But anyway, uh, you can see here, uh, these cattle were about 700 pounds. Uh, and this is a culmination of different studies. So this isn't one particular study. Uh, it's pooling uh, a bunch of different results uh, that looked at the same same thing. So that's why the those initial body weights or those weights in to the trial were uh, deviate a little bit. But anyway, you can see here the average daily gain almost near that three mark. But the difference here being um, I've, I've averaged the difference between the two implant uh, 
treatment versus no implant. So it's just the average difference here between those. And so it's about two tenths of a pound, right? So it fits right in that 10% improvement in average daily gain. And then here the we see an improvement in feed to cane, right? Lower numbers better, right? Less feed per pound of uh, beef that we're putting on. And so in that sense, you can see improvement in feed to gain without really uh, any adjustments uh, to feed intake. Uh, in that sense. So with that result over 140 days at two tenths of a pound, uh, that nets 30 pounds uh, roughly of, of additional body weight um, from, from those two uh, implant programs. So row grower that's in of excess. And we'll come back to that number in terms of what that really means in dollars. But uh, I do want to share where I got this information. This is a great resource uh, for anyone that's interested in looking at um, uh, you know, potential uh, implant programs that they might want to implement in, in your own systems. And so here, if you just go to the Merck and Te Texas Tech University uh, North American TBA implant database, you can select here, this is just a screenshot of the website, but you can go up here and select uh, different implant studies and look at the differences. Uh, and that's where I got those values that we just looked at. So it's a great resource here. Okay, so I think this is a great uh, study that demonstrates maybe a perception that we have and that implants can wreck a calf and send them down the wrong path in terms of growth. And so uh, Gentry and others here um, looked at that, right? So they, they, they basically set calves up to fail because with implant programs, what you need to make sure you do is you work towards more concentrated levels. So you start at a, a moderate or a weaker dose and you work towards higher concentrations as that calf moves throughout um, its, its growth. So as, as we go from a suckling calf implant uh, to a backgrounding or a stalker type implant to finishing, we're increasing the dose, uh, concentration of the dose, um, but, but it's important not to go too far too fast in, in, that, in this process. And this study looked at that. So we have two, two uh, or excuse me, three treatments in a sense. So none, right, uh, where calves were not given an implant at uh, 45 days old. So, right, we're talking about uh, a calf in this sense, right, a suckling calf. Or a very, very aggressive implant here, right, by design, uh, Thinivex 1 graft. So that would be at the combination of estradiol and TBA. And so a very aggressive form of, of implant, especially for a calf that's 45 days old. And then we have conventional, right, which uh, some might use Cinevex choice as a suckling calf implant uh, in some regards, or maybe a row grow would fit really well in here as well. So then uh, wean those calves at 221 days of age, and then followed up with a Cinevex choice in the background uh, then moved to a Cinevex Plus in the finisher and then harvested those cattle at, you know, well over a year old. Okay, so at the bottom here um, are those body weights. So days of age here at 221, that's the weaning weight. So you can see that aggressive implant definitely added body weight in that sense. So uh, some might consider that or look at this as a, a means of um, that implant worked, and it certainly did. But I go back to that whole building a, a implant program from the start and working your way towards uh, more concentrated forms. And so what you can see here is by 266, right, the start of that backgrounding phase, um, those still, those calves maintain that body weight. But by the time they started their finisher, uh, that, that had, you know, that weight was gone. So these calves over here, the conventional, they had shipped off already, but I think it was a good comparison at the beginning. But you can see here that there was no benefits um, by adding that finisher implant, that Cinevex Plus. They added that at 351 days, and that resulted in no uh, further improvements, which uh, time over time, we know there should have been improvements in that situation uh, by adding that that last implant suggesting uh, that, you know, those animals had been uh, used way too aggressive implant right up front at the beginning. And therefore, as a result, we're not responsive to that, that last implant during that finishing phase. 
Another perception that I wanted to talk about is the impact of implanted calves at sale barns in that sense. So um, there's been some good work here done, uh, two studies combined here, uh, dating from 2010 to 2018, and they used superior livestock auctions to evaluate uh, no Im or implants in blue bars and no implants in red bars. So you can see across years uh, the difference in average price. And, uh, and then I've listed those prices here so you can actually see. And, and ultimately, there's, there's really no uh, real significant difference between those prices, between those, uh, you know. And, and so, I, it, you know, even as we think about selling your background of calves, maybe, you know, as, as, as yearlings and uh, going to the sale barn with those, implanting those calves, um, you know, done right, doesn't affect them in subsequent uh, stages of production, as well as shouldn't bring any uh, uh, lower price relative to uh, cattle not implanted. Again, you could be, you know, certified into a natural program or organic program in that sense, by all means. But, uh, but I always encourage producers, if you're not capitalizing on some value added program, such as using implants, uh, you certainly want to take advantage of, of one of these uh, avenues. So in that 2010 to 2013 data, there was 17,000 uh, lots uh, sold through um, Superior Livestock Auction here in North Dakota. And of those, 40% uh, were implanted. I don't know what that number is now. I'd be very curious to find out. But that was the data back then, 10 years ago. So these are the steer implants, um, again, building up from top of the, of the screen to the bottom and building up in, in concentration. So basically when we're talking backgrounding cattle, we're talking about these ones here. So the, the estrogen only or the mild combination in that sense. So the ones at the bottom of the screen would be fit for the finishing period. And, and again, so using being strategic in that sense. Same thing here with feedlot heifer implants and uh, and having estrogen-based ones at the top there and then mild combinations and some moderate combinations there could be included in a backgrounding, um, uh, your background implant program. So how long do they last? Well, you got to look at days after implantation, right? So at the bottom here, you can kind of see we go 50 days up to 100, 250 days after implanting those cattle. And basically what you see is Hume concentrations would be the level of the um, the uh, the hormone in, in the in the blood, and so basically you can kind of see that there's there's essentially we're reaching kind of that lower threshold between somewhere between maybe sixty to one hundred days, right? And so it's it's really important when you think about uh, multiple implant uh, strategies, you know, going from a growing into a finishing. You never want to be run out of implant in that sense uh because uh, those cattle will just they might start to plateau on on gain and so you, you don't want to run out but you certainly don't want to uh, implant too soon so it's there's a delicate balance there but but in terms of kind of understanding you know how many days your cattle are going to be on feed when you intend to market them and all those things that all plays into what implant you should look at and 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 utilize and and uh, uh just because you you really don't want to run out uh, of implant uh, before you're done, kind of, or before they move on to the next stage. These, by all means, are not accurate prices, but they're relatively uh, just to give an idea. So basically, those implants we're talking about for the backgrounding would be in that three to four dollar range. So I just kind of wanted to um, show those, and then I'm going to use a four dollar implant in this situation. So why we implant? We add, we improve average daily gain, we improve feed efficiency. So you're getting more out of your feed, right? And you're getting, you're producing more beef with that feed. So here we have, if an uh, implant costs us four dollars, and we put on again that thirty pounds, right? That that initial um, uh, example I, I showed you, uh, we added thirty pounds over a hundred and forty day uh, feeding period, and so at two dollars and thirty cents, right? Two hundred and thirty a hundred weight. Uh, that number we've been using all night tonight and, and 
take that times that those 30 pounds that you added, right, compared to a non-implanted calf, and, and you're going to grow $69, right? You take that $4 implant out of the situation, right, and you've got a 16 to 1 ROI in that sense. So really, time over time, like I said, um, we know a lot about implants, and and we can expect to see differences. Uh, you know, it's it usually have to do a study, right, where you've got no implanted cattle next to implanted cattle to really know if you, if there's a difference. If you implant all your cattle, it's really hard to understand if it worked or not because you don't have any comparison, right, of, of what calves without an implant would have done in that sense. So, okay. It's important, though, that um, if you're going to utilize implants that you do it properly. Um, once you know the technique and, and practice proper sanitation, it's a really useful tool. However, if you don't practice proper sanitation, uh, really you could be wasting that $4 in the sense. So during processing of calves, implanting should be the rate limiting step. It should not be the, um, the you know, you need to take time and, and make sure you're, that you've sanitized the needle effectively, right? And, and that they're, the ear is clean in that sense. And so again, we're, where we're implanting is going to be right in the middle third, both vertically and horizontally in the ear. And uh, I'm sure you all are familiar if you do implant with that blue solution right there. One thing you need to know is check the label on the chlorhexidine solution, because more than likely it's in concentrated form and that you do not need it in concentrated form to sanitize or sterilize the, the needle. Uh, really, all you need is one of the empty jugs and fill it up to that bottom ridge uh, with your blue solution, fill the rest with water. That in itself is going to be enough to sanitize the needle. Then what you need is one of these grout sponges. Don't use a regular kitchen sponge. Use one of these grout ones. You can get them at any hardware store typically. Use a paint tray and then have a brush. And that, that grout sponge goes in the paint tray and then you that's what you'll be wiping the needle off with. Not only do you want to wipe off blood or anything like that, you want to make sure you get the hair off the needle. Because as you can imagine, your a lot of hair ends up getting caught on that needle, and you could end up embedding that hair in with the implant under the skin, which can just cause a potential infection in that situation. You want to avoid implanting cattle in a rain event. Cattle that are dirty and it's raining, you're gonna you're exposing right the inside of that ear. And when it's raining, that dirty water that's come, you know, coming off is going to go into that, that space where that implant is and cause another potential for infection. So avoid rainy days as much as you possibly can. Make sure you're sanitizing that needle in between. You do not need to change the needle except for when uh, you're starting to notice uh, getting it dull or if you ram it accidentally into the chute or something like that. Okay, so... I already talked about, you know, you got to, it takes practice, right? To get proper placement of that. You want to make sure you don't uh, inject that implant too fast because what you end up doing is crushing some of the pellets and the pellets are designed, of course, to be whole uh, because if you crush them, they'll be absorbed faster in that payout period of 60 to 100 days uh, will end up becoming really short in that sense. Proper location is important because you don't want to implant and then have somebody follow up with putting an ear tag right through that implant, right? You'll just crush the implant or you'll kind of create uh, potential scarring in that area. You're relying on blood flow to absorb that implant from the back of the ear. And so you want to make sure you don't embed it into the cartilage too, right? You go in parallel with the cartilage under the skin. And any time, right, an, an implant won't work, you can tell because that ear will abscess, right, and it'd be hard, uh, more than likely, uh, and leads to basically the, the animal walling off that area. And then uh, your implant will be completely intact on the back of the ear and, and rendered useless. Okay, so with the time that I have left, I want to talk about some of the changes that occurred this past summer. So... Um, First and foremost, it's really important uh, that you check your implant labels. 
um, because these new changes have now required some label change and uh, in order to understand what implants you may have. So if you have implants from last year or maybe even earlier this summer still around and they're still good, they're perfectly fine to use, those labels aren't going to show the, the new updates, right? So I'm talking about labels from newly purchased implants will have uh, some of their uh, label information updated. And if you ever, you can always look labels up online for the most updated uh, label for the, the whatever product you have, if you have concerns. So anyway, guidance for industry 191 from the FDA came out and it changed production phases, which we'll talk a little bit about in a second. It impacted backgrounding specifically. So it, it impacted finishing, but uh, finishing and backgrounding uh, pretty much were the ones impacted the most. And then we'll talk about how change of ownership or location doesn't affect this guidance. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't improve the situation, I'll say, and that there's no extra label use for implants. And, uh, and this all occurred starting J July 1st of 2023. Okay, so there used to be four production phases. Now there's five production phases. And so calves less than two months of age and calves two months of age and older. So this would be your suckling calf implants. Um, if, if you use any of those in your calves. Okay. So this, this third uh, production phase has always existed, right? This is our calves that are on pasture, our yearlings, things like that. That hasn't changed those. Uh, um, nothing's changed within those implants or those calves. This is a new phase growing beef steers in age or heifers in a dry lot with diet uh, consisting of primarily harvested forage. So that's a brand new production phase. Uh, in that sense, there wasn't any implants um, designed for that phase, uh, but there is now, and we'll talk about that in just a second. This is where I was talking about it gets tricky. So production phase five is growing beef steers, heifers in confinement for slaughter. That considers backgrounding and finishing. So where before there wasn't stipulations on this, now they're 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 really lumped into one production phase. But what guidance 191 has done is not allowed reimplantation within a production phase unless it is stated on the label. There are some implants that are labeled to be can be reimplanted. And so you need to check your label. However, there are some that are not. And where this is affected is if you implant in the backgrounding sector, and then depending on which one you use, and then you sell your calf, maybe even to your neighbor and they finish it. If they go and put an implant in, that's technically uh, outside and not allowed. That would be off-label use of implants depending on which implant you're using. Be, be, and it's off-label because both the backgrounding and the finishing seg sectors are not are considered one production phase. And that means you can only implant once in that production phase unless the label states. And we'll talk about which ones do state uh, for re-implant. So again, uh, if you've got calves that are consuming dry hay, and you feed them a little grain or a little distiller's uh, uh, grains or, or something, uh, just kind of pale feed and supplementing, those calves are now in their own new um, production phase. Uh, and up till about two months ago, there wasn't an implant approved for that production phase because it was a brand new production phase. Therefore, none of the manufacturing companies had needed a label uh, prior to July 1st for that. Now what we have is Ralgro, Merck Animal Health's Ralgro is approved for that phase. That's the only implant approved for that specific phase. So, okay, so grow yards. And I'm not going to go and read this uh, thoroughly through here. Uh, really what I want to talk about is grow yards, a change in ration at a progressively high energy diet is not a change in production phase. So that's where FDA defined that a backgrounding diet, even if it's primarily forage, is not different and is not a different production state phase than finishing. 
and then this bolded part, unless the implants are used or approved and labeled for use as in reimplantation programs for growing steers, uh, they cannot be used. So again, before July 1st, we could put a Revlar IS in during the backgrounding phase. We could come in and put a Cinevex uh, S in uh, behind that, and then we could follow up with a Cinevex Plus uh, or something like that. We could all do that while all the calves are in the pens. That's all changed now. And so I'll just throw one example in here. So we've got suckling calf phase, growing in background phase, and feedlot cattle phase. And I'll throw up some so Cinevex C in the suckling phase, then followed up with Cinevex Choice, and then following that with Cinevex 1 feedlot, right? That would be prior to July 1st, perfectly fine, right? Uh, not, but but now I'll talk about, okay, and then another example would be nothing during the suckling phase, Revlar IS followed by Revlar, Revlar XS. So Cinevex is a Zoetis product, Revlar is a Merck product. This one is still on label because Cinevex Choice is labeled for reimplantation. This one is not allowed because again, that growing and background phase is in the same production phase as the feedlot phase now. So uh, Revlar IS is not approved to be in a reimplantation program. So in this case, producer would, would either have to switch product from the Revlar uh, Merck products over to the Cinevex or not implant during the background phase to allow them to implant during the feedlot phase. Excuse me, the, the finishing portion. Okay, so change in ownership or location of the cattle does not uh, uh, define a change in production phase. So again, if you are background them and then they move to another feedlot to be finished, that's still technically same production phase. It follows the calf wherever it goes. Uh, I already covered no extra label use for ear implants in that sense, right? So while we're talking about off-label use in that sense, veterinarians um, cannot uh, uh, provide off-label use of implants like they can with some um, uh, other drugs. And so unless it specifically states right on the label that it's allowed to, for reimplantation, uh, it cannot be used within the same production phase. So what we have is out of the 27 implants available currently, we have four that are approved for reimplantation. And that's uh, Encore, Compido, Cinevex, Cinevex S, technically Cinevex 1 feedlot. So what you have to do is since we're talking background today, you have to start with Cinevex choice. Again, that's just logical anyway, because you're building up that, that concentration, right? And moving towards more aggressive. Uh, but then in the feedlot, then you move them up, right? Step them up onto a finisher. That would allow you then to use Cinevex Plus and another Cinevex choice or Cinevex 1 feedlot. So this is that's a, an example of what you can do. Now, I'm sure the other companies, uh, Merck and Alenco, are working towards changing their labels. This just happens to be one that's already has a label change. Mm -hmm.